Let me run quickly through the quiz. Um, so the quizzes were good, right? Um, everybody passed. Everybody seems to have the basics. Um, a few details here and there. So let's let's just hit some of the detail points. Um, so combinations and permutations. So three-digit integer consists of three digits, which means the first digit is not a zero. So how many three-digit integers are there? So this can be a straight um, product rule. So how many ways can you pick the first digit? Well, it can be anything from one through nine, but it can't be a zero. So you get nine options for the first digit, 10 for the second, 10 for the third. There's 900 three-digit integers. And that makes sense. It basically goes from 100 through 999. And if you count those, you'll find 900 things in that range. Okay, how many three-digit integers are there containing only even digits? So um, same problem, but you're restricted to only these five symbols. So if you think of a three-digit integer as still not being allowed to start with a zero, this would be four for your first, five for your second, five for your third. That's a hundred. Someone came up to me during the test and asked if a three-digit integer could start with a zero, and for some reason I think I said yes. So I, I gave you wiggle room on here. If you did five times five times five for 125, you got credit for that also. But technically as a three-digit integer, it's got to start with a zero, so you only have four choices for the first digit. Okay, how many three-digit integers contain exactly one five? So here you got to get a little tricky. You got to do a sum rule and a product rule. Um, because to contain exactly one five, well, there's three possibilities. The five could be in the first place, or in the second place, or in the third place. So um, task one, your number looks like five something something. And how many ways can you write a three digit number that begins with a five? Well, you break that into a set of tasks. Write this digit, write that digit. And there's 10 ways to fill in each of those. So this is 10 times 10 equals 100 ways to do task one. A few people multiplied by five just because it's right there and it's saying multiply by me, but you don't multiply by five. This is really one way to pick that digit and then 10 and 10. Isn't it nine, uh, would you say only one five? Oh yes, yes, you're right, you're right. Thank you. So yeah, if, if you have exactly one five, those others can't have a five in them. So there's only nine ways to fill these in. So that's 81 ways if you start with a five. Task two, the alternative is put your five in the middle. And so you've got nine ways to fill this in. If you're still not allowing a leading zero, you got eight ways to do this. So this would be 72 or maybe 81 if you allow things to start with a zero. And then task three, same thing got nine ways and eight ways, so 72 ways to do that. So 142, 200 and... Oh, because the zero. Yeah, yeah, because you're not allowed to have a zero. So 144 and 81 is 225. And if you allow the zeros in the front, then it's 81 times three, which is 243. So you got credit for either of those. So product rule or combination product rule, some rule. Um, a bunch of people did six questions. A few people did all seven questions. So I just graded the first ones um, in that case. Um, so proved in a room with 10 people, at least two must have been born on the same day of the week. You got to say pigeonhole principle somewhere. If you argued this reasonably well, you got most of the points. If you argued it, but not very rigorously, you got half the points. If you said pigeonhole principle and you argued around that, you probably got full credit. So pigeonhole principle says um, if you have n objects and k bins, right, at least one bin is going to have this many objects in it. So 10, 7 is 1.4. And so the ceiling of 10 sevenths is 2. So straight from the pigeonhole principle, at least one bin has at least two people in it. And those two people have the same day of the week. So describe the bins based on day of the week. Put people into a bin based on when they were born.
and then pigeonhole does the rest of the work. So that's pretty much every pigeonhole principle problem. Uh, difference between permutation and combination. Permutations, ordered or unordered? Permutation is ordered, combinations are unordered. That's the whole, that's the key difference. Um, so if you mentioned that, but you got them switched around, you lost a few points. Um, all right, subgroup of three people is being selected from a group of seven. How many different subgroups are possible? The order in which the people are selected is irrelevant. That makes it a combination. So it's a number of ways you can choose three things out of seven where we don't care about the order. So seven factorial over three factorial times four factorial. And if you got that far, you got full credit. And if you work it out, these look hairy, but if you actually write them out, 7 factorial over 3 factorial, let's just multiply down to this lower number plus 1. Right, so 7 times 6 times 5 times 4, because the other 3, 2, 1 will cancel out from here. And then divide by um, 4 factorial. So 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2, which is 4 times 6. So those cancel, this leaves you 35. But if you got it down to this formula, you were fine. Because I'm not testing arithmetic, which is fortunate in some cases. <coughs> Our permutation would just be with the three factorial off of the bottom. Permutation would be seven factorial over four factorial. Oh, because it would just leave the 7 minus 3 factorial. Yeah, 7 over 7 minus 3. And that turns out to be 210, I think. Which is the 35 ways you can pick three people multiplied by six ways you can arrange those three people that you've already picked. So 35 times 6 gets you up to 210. All right, significance of the 20, we talked about this afterwards. This is number of ways you can choose three things out of six. So sixth row, zero, one, two, third element over. So each entry in Pascal's triangle is a combination. Um, arranging five people for a picture. So you could do this as, um, Product rule, five ways to pick the first person, four for the second, three, two, one, gets you 120. You could also say this is the number of ways to choose five people out of five where we pay attention to order, which is five factorial over zero factorial, which is five factorial. And all of those get you the same value. All right, and Dijkstra's algorithm. I think everybody knows Dijkstra's algorithm. This is awesome because I don't have to give it to you on the final exam, which makes me happy because... But then that would be just a free problem. Yeah, you can still do it. <laughs> I could do it, but it would be a worse problem. Oh. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay? No, that's awesome that people understand this. I mean, this is, this is one of the things you'll take away from this, and it'll come up in an interview someday when you're sitting across a desk from someone you say well I just use Dijkstra's algorithm or someone will show you some code and you'll say you forgot to relax that note over there and they'll double your salary on the spot it'll be good <laughs> <laughs> alright so we're starting from A we have tentative distances so um, and in most cases it was it was easy to tell what people were doing because everything was marked accordingly um, <laughs> So relax the distances that are adjacent to A, so let's change this to a one, and let's label the path AC. This is zero and the path is A. And then you visit the node that's closest to A, so I'm gonna move down here. This is A zero, this is AC one, and I'm gonna visit the D. Sorry, I visited the C. I'm gonna relax distances from C. So 1 plus 1 is 2, and that's A, C, D. And 1 to here plus 2 to B is 3, 
that's ACB, and this is still an infinity. And I'm going to redraw that down here. So there's A0, there's 3 ACB. That's already been visited. That's 1 AC. Here's 2 ACD. And here's infinity. And we visit the node that's closest to A now, which looks like D. So circle that. Relax the distances from there. At this point, you should say I can get here in a distance of 2. 3 more gets me to E. 5 is better than infinity, so this should become a 5 A, C, D, E. And I gotta see that to know you're doing this right. Alright, that's all we can relax from there, so now we want to visit whatever node is closest, so copy all of this. This is 5 A, C, D, E, but it's not circled yet, right? And this is 3 ACB. It's not circled yet. But now we're going to visit the node that's closest to A. Well, the only things we haven't visited are node B, which is 3, node E, which is 5. So B is the closest. So circle that. And then relax the distances. And at this point, 3 plus 1 is 4. That becomes a better solution. So 4 ACBE. And then if you wanted to copy this over onto the next figure and circle the 4, you could do that. But if you left it here, that would be fine because that's the only node that we haven't visited yet. So I would circle that. ACBE, there's your answer. So. All make sense? Number two? Oh, the pigeonhole? So, so the generalized pigeonhole principle says if you have n objects and you have k containers and that you're putting into at least one container is going to have at least this many objects, yeah. right? So this is this is 10 divided by 7 and this is the ceiling function. So the smallest integer bigger than or equal to this is 2. Right, so that says that if you take ten things, put them in seven bins, at least one bin is going to have at least two objects. So I thought ten divided by seven equals one point four. If 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 equal one point five, we can put up in a bit two. No, this is this is not rounding. This is this is a different function. So ceiling of one point zero zero one is actually two. Right, so ceiling of x equals the smallest integer bigger than or equal to x. Right, so it's a little different from rounding. As soon as you're a little bit above one integer, you got to go all the way up to the next one. And that's what happens if you have 101 objects and you only have 100 bins. Right, that would be the ceiling at 1.01. .01. That jumps up to a 2. That's the usual pigeonhole. n plus 1 objects n bins. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Well, let's keep moving forward. So we were talking about languages and we were playing with some phrase structure grammars. And we did one on the board and it looked like this.
right, so we had five production rules. And we got to start with the start symbol S. So that start symbol is um, R. So R can become either 0A or 1A. And those are the only options. So we know whatever we get is going to start with either a 0 or a 1, followed by whatever an A is. So let's just think about what an A is. Um, a is either a 0B or, uh, well, it's got to be a 0B. And B is either a 1 or it's a 1 followed by an A. Okay, so A could be a 0, 1. Or it could be a 0 followed by a 1 followed by an A, which could be 0, 1. Or it could be a 0 followed by a 1 followed by anything that's an A, which is either a 0, 1 or maybe a 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on. And so it looks like this matches either a 0 or a 1 followed by some repetition of this string 0, 1. So we could write this as um, and does it have to have at least one zero one? Yeah. Right? Because it can't be, it can't, if, if we had A going to lambda we could just have just our opening zero or one but we don't so I can write this as follows. So any string that starts with a 0 and is followed by n repetitions of 0, 1, where n is bigger than or equal to 1, or something starting with a 1 with the same repetition, and that's kind of a shorthand for writing all this stuff out. Now let me mention something about production rules. And this, this is a, a very sort of high level description of, of grammars and languages. We can get very detailed in an automata course. You'll go into different types of grammars um, with different characteristics. But let me point out something about these production rules and all the production rules that we're going to write while we talk about this. Um, If you have a string we'd like to be able to apply these production rules and see if this string corresponds to something going from our initial symbol to this right by following these rules. So for example we could say okay um, our starting string could turn into a 0a well here's a 0 is this possibly something that matches an A? And so what's an A? Well, it's a zero followed by a B. Well, here's a zero, so now we want to know, is this possibly something that matches a B? And we can say, well, B could be a one, but there's more to it than just that, but it could be a one followed by an A. Okay, well, there's a one, so this piece right here, could that possibly be an A? And there's a zero, so that could eat up that zero. So then the question is, this one, one, zero, one, could that be a B? Well, it could be a one followed by an A, so is one, zero, one, an A. Well, an A has to be a zero followed by a B. We don't have a zero right there. We can say, okay, this does not match an A. So this original string is not part of this language, okay? But suppose your production rules contain something like this. And we have some original string. And we want to know if that's an A. Well, we'd get to this rule and we'd say, OK, could this be an A? Well, if it begins with an A, then maybe it is. So is this string an A? 
and we'd say, well, I don't know. Let's call our A check function and hand it this and see if it's an A. Well, does it begin with an A? Well, I don't know. Let's call our A check function and see if this begins with an A. And if you think of this in terms of how you would write code to check each of these production rules against a string, this is possibly going to go on forever. Right? Because the first thing we're searching for in our string is an A, which requires us to call our check to see if this is an A. And when we check to see if it's an A, we're going to say, well, okay, see if it starts with an A. And we're going to keep calling our function forever. Whereas these production rules, they begin with something that will use up at least one of the symbols in our string. That's the informal way of thinking about it. And is that kind of the best practice? And that's, if we were to turn this into code, we would need that to be happening, right? Unless, unless we're going to do something really clever, like say, well, it ends with a zero, so could this be an A, but we'd be going from the other direction. So I'll, I'll come back to this as we start developing these production rules, and, and I think you'll get the idea what I'm talking about. All right, so, so this is all leading up to the idea of synthesis. So suppose we want to create a phrase structure grammar that describes certain strings. So here's what I want the language to be. I want the language to include lambda, the empty string, a 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, three zeros followed by three ones, and so on. So this looks like 0 to the n, 1 to the n, where n is bigger than or equal to 0. So if n is 0, this is no zeros or 1s, that's the empty string. If n is 1, it's a 0 followed by a 1. If n is 2, it's 0, 0 followed by 1, 1, and so on. So I want to recognize any number of zeros followed by the same number of 1s. Can you do this with a C program? Yeah. Count the number of zeros, then count the number of ones and see if they're equal. What if I have more than four billion zeros? <coughs> then it would take a really long time to still do it. But my integer count overflows at two billion. So uh, if uh, n equals zero, so zero, no zero. That's, that's the empty string, so there's no bits in there. Yeah, that's unsigned, what lambda means. Unsigned long, long end. Still a <laughs> limit, though. If I have like 10 to the thousandth zeros followed by 10 to the thousand ones, there's only so much memory in the computer, there's only so high I can count. And if I have more zeros than that, say what? Can you not store them as strings? Because strings can be long. But they're limited by the memory of the computer. Could you start from the beginning digit and the last digit, work your way inwards, and see if any of them are equal? That might work. But if they're equal, then you know it's a no. Yeah, that might be a good way around it. This assumes we can store these strings in memory. Yeah. But yeah, I might give you that one. Um, can we write a phrase structure grammar to recognize these things? So how do we possibly even start this? Well, if we have to include the empty set, then that means R would have to be able to turn into nothing. OK. So let's do a start symbol of R. And let's have a rule that says R can turn into lambda. Um, our terminal symbols are just going to be 0 and 1. And lambda is not a symbol, OK? Lambda means the string with zero length. Think of it as like, quote, quote, with nothing in between, OK? So, so this is a string with no symbols in it. So we wouldn't need to put lambda in this set of terminals, right? We're making a string with nothing, no symbols yeah, in it. You could, you'd need a middleman, so maybe an A or something. OK, so we probably need some kind of, of temporary symbol. So play around with this on, on paper for a minute or two and see
see where you get to. So raise your hand if you got an idea. What's your idea? Uh, you could have zero be able to turn into zero zero. Um, we can't redef. Mm, let's see. Let's not redefine symbol terminal symbols. We can redefine R. We can redefine A. so that A can turn into a 0 and B can turn into a 0. I mean, B can turn into a 1. And then use those. Okay. And then you could turn R into A, B, and then A could turn into A, A. And then B could be able to turn into B, B. What do we think? I think so. I think A could turn into A, A, and B could just be a single one. And A could be a zero. So I think this would admit zero, zero, one. But this is feeling like the right direction. Uh, what, I, what I came up with is I had R can go to A, and then A can go to zero, A, one, or it can go to zero, one. Okay, R can go to A, A is either 0, 1, which we know is good, or it could be 0 followed by A followed by 1. And that A in the middle could be a 0, 1. So that would be 0, 0, 1, 1. So A could be 0, 1, or 0 followed by A followed by 1, or 0 followed by this version of A followed by a 1. Does that look good? So I think that gets us there, and it can also be empty. So I would buy that. Yeah, I was trying to expand outwards. This is expanding from the inside. Yeah, yeah. And we could also, instead of having R go to lambda, we could have A go to lambda. Same thing, and there's usually a lot of different ways you can write these, right? And they're all kind of equally good. So, so if you come up with a way that doesn't look exactly like what somebody else comes up with, that's not a problem, right? As long as, as it gets you the same language in the end. You could also do R goes to lambda or R goes to zero R one. And that just combines the function of R and A. So different ways to do that. All right, so as I said Friday, this is this is the harder direction, right? When you're synthesizing, it's um You know, designing a circuit that acts a certain way instead of analyzing a circuit 
building a state machine that does some function versus analyzing a state machine. The synthesis is usually trickier. Let's try this. So this language is 0 to the m, 1 to the n. m and n are both bigger than or equal to 0. So what kinds of strings would we find in here? Just as some examples. The entire binary counting? Yeah. Well, not really. I don't think we have a 1, 0, 1. So this is m zeros followed by n ones where m and n are bigger than or equal to zero. So what are some strings in here? Zero one. Zero one, good. Got the idea? Any amount of zeros followed by any amount of ones? Any number of zeros followed by any number of ones, including no zeros, including no ones, which means it could also have the empty string. So any binary number, zero or more bits, as long as it's zeros in the beginning and ones at the end. All right, so how could we come up with a set of production rules to produce all of those strings and only those strings? There's no algorithm for this. Trial and error. So trial and error for a minute. Not explicitly, but indirectly, basically, yeah. <coughs> so let's let's pause this. Let's do a sub problem. Suppose we just want to write a phrase structure grammar for a string consisting of zero or more zeros. Empty string one zero two zeros a million and seven zeros. <laughs> Zero, A, A can go to zero, and A can go to R. So R goes to zero, A, A goes to zero, or A goes to R. I like that. What do you think about this? Okay. 
So does this capture the empty string? So there's an empty string, or it could be a zero followed by an A, which could be an empty string, so that would get a zero. Or it could be a zero followed by an R, which could be a zero, followed by an A, which could be an R, which could be an empty string, so that would be two zeros, so I think that would get you nice. What do you mean, where? The R goes to Sanda. Is that necessary? Um, if R doesn't go to something other than 0A, this is never going to end. So what do you do? R goes to 0. Then, then so we could do R goes to 0. Sorry, sorry. Not, not R goes to R goes to A? A goes to 0. There you go. That's true. Okay, so um, so R could be a zero followed by an A, which is a zero, so it's got that. Or it could be zero followed by A, which is an R, which is an A, which could be... Yeah, so I don't think we can get more zeros in there. Right, because that'll bounce to an A, which will bounce back to an R. So I don't think those will actually add any bits. So R goes to lambda, we'll pick up that lambda, which we're looking for. Mm -hmm. You got a different? Uh, I might have solved the other one. Okay. So let me suggest a different one for this. empty string, or it could be a zero followed by the empty string, or a zero followed by a zero followed by the empty string. All right, so that'll chew up any number of zeros, including none. So we can make a pattern that will give us a repetition of zero or more zeros. Could we also do the same thing for a repetition of ones? Right, so I could do Q goes to 1Q or Q goes to lambda. And then you'd have to add in two more variables and say R or whatever the starting is. You go to yeah, so let me change this to T. And then our start symbol is just a T followed by a Q. So there's a repetition of zeros, there's a repetition of ones. So we can start putting these things together like we do when we're writing C code and we make functions and we put them together and call them from a bigger function. We can kind of use a similar mindset to make these grammars, right? If we can break our problem into pieces such as I want a set of zeros followed by a set of ones. Right, well first let's make something that gives me this and let's make something that gives me that and let's put them side by side. Was that close to what you came up with? Yeah, that's exactly Okay, cool. How about this? We want 
a pattern of three zeros, six zeros, nine zeros, twelve zeros, etc. So some collection of zeros where the number of zeros is a multiple of three. And I said n bigger than or equal to one, so I want at least three zeros. I'm not going to bother writing the terminal symbols and the start and the vocabulary. Let's just write the production rules. R goes to lambda, and then R goes to zero, 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 R. So that certainly grabs three zeros, six zeros, nine zeros, but I don't really want lambda to be a recognized by this because I'm insisting ends at least one so this can contain this or this but I want to exclude lambda two zeros are to zero. What is, yeah. so you do r goes to zero zero r and r goes to zero yeah or four zeros Don't be afraid to use Wait, no, temporary no. variables. So this was almost perfect, except it included an empty string. Let's just say R goes to zero 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 A and then A can go to zero. I mean A can go to yeah. <coughs> What about that? So that bottom part gets the, the zero, three, six, nine zeros. And our start symbol must begin with three zeros followed by either zero, three, six, nine zeros. Does that get you that? All right, so we just shove the three zeros in the beginning because we want those and then we tacked on something that gives us the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. Everything is mathematical induction. <laughs> All right, so let's do a five minute break and we'll switch gears and look at a different way to express syntax.